Um, so first of all, I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of background um, before we kind of dive into what I wanted to talk about tonight. So the first thing you should know is that um, the reason I'm the most happiest to be here is because I am a Colorado girl at heart. I was born here, obviously drinking Coors from a very young age. Um, my parents met when my dad was going to DU. My parents are can wave right now and let you know who they are. So. Don't let them ask any questions during the Q&A. <laughs> so I was born here, um, but yet my parents uh, moved away. For We moved to St. Louis for most of my uh, childhood life, but they had the good sense to move back here, which is a great testament to their character. And I also, uh, because I had been so predisposed to how awesome uh, Colorado is, I went to see you. So here's a picture of me studying. And you can also see a theme. I realize both pictures have me drinking beer, which is, I think that's a good theme in my life, very representative. Um, and then another exciting thing is, of course, I told you my parents, oh, I majored in journalism, um, majored in advertising, actually, which I'll talk more about later. And um, then my parents moved back here, back here a few years ago and also built a house in Crested Butte, and that's where I got married this summer. So I am a very big fan of your, of your state because it has given me a new life with my new husband, who's also a graphic designer, if you would believe it or not. I'm not going to show you a bunch of wedding pictures. Maybe just one more. Aww. So cute. <laughs> so I've always been such a huge fan of Colorado. It's in my blood, obviously. Um, I'm such a fan of how progressive your policies are, um, especially after this week. <laughs> I also read that um, now the Denver Nuggets have the most appropriate name in the NBA of all the teams after this week's vote, which I thought was quite, uh, <laughs> it might take a minute to get that joke, but, um, but I do think you have a, an incredibly progressive and incredibly open-minded um, group of people who live in the state, and I, I especially think that's true for the creative community. We were just talking about a place like Boulder, which when I left school, I could never have imagined it would blossom into this incredible like tech center, basically like rivaling you know Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of great exciting stuff going on here, and I'm watching you guys. I'm, I'm always have my eye on you guys. But I want to go back to this day. Um, I'm not going to tell you the details about what happened that day, but this was right uh, before I graduated. And so um, when I was uh, at CU, of course, I was a journalism major. There, there actually going through some changes with the journalism school right now. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, but I was in the advertising program there. I always wanted to be in advertising my entire life, which is so weird. Like from when I was a kid, I wanted to make commercials. That was like my dream. So when I got out of school, I was super excited to start this new life of, of me being an advertising copywriter. So I, the funny thing about my career is I've actually had multiple careers, so I'm going to quickly go through all the multiple careers that I've had, and then we can jump into the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. So here's me graduating and getting out into the real world. I wanted to live in New York and work at an ad agency and drink martinis at lunch and all this stuff that I had heard about what it was like to be an advertising creative. Hopefully not have like a secret pregnancy or anything. But... <laughs> For those of you who don't watch the show, you're like, what? Um, so this to me was like what I thought my life was going to be. I thought I was going to live in Manhattan and drink Manhattans and be this amazing creative. But it didn't really work out that way. I graduated during the dot-com. This is like bouncing a lot in my face. Um, uh, I graduated during the dot-com bubble, which I realized some people are actually too young to know what that means after I spoke at a school a while ago. So it's basically like what it is now with the recession, except all my friends got hired for really big jobs with really high salaries and moved into really expensive apartments and then lost their job. So just imagine what that would be like for everyone that you know. So a lot of my friends were moving to San Francisco, getting these amazing dot-com jobs. I didn't get offered a job anywhere. I worked as hard as I could to try to get something, anything, anywhere, and there was nothing being offered to me. So I moved to LA, of all places. Um, there were some opportunities there, freelance opportunities that seemed good. Um, and there were some people that I know that were moving there that I wanted to live near. So I was okay with that. But I didn't even end up getting a job in advertising there. I ended up getting a job at a production company. And at a production company, what you mostly do is get people coffee, and then get people lunch, and then get people dinner, 
And then sometimes you have to do like other weird tasks that I can't go into detail about because my parents are here. So basically, this is who I became when I moved to LA. So I was in this pretty fun job. I mean, we were interacting with like a lot of musicians and big time directors and um, oddly enough, ad agencies that were making commercials. So I was having a great time, but I wasn't doing what I said I was going to do when I graduated from school and my whole life. You know, I thought I had this great career in advertising. So I decided to take the summer off from this job, and I was going to go find myself in Europe. So here's me for that summer. And I did this way before Julia Roberts did it, by the way. Like, I did it, like, you know, and before the book was even written, the original book. This was my gelato adventure. So I went to Europe for the summer, and I was like, I'm going to figure out what I'm doing, and I'm going to bring my computer, and I'm going to write every chance I can. I'm going to become this like, really amazing writer. I'm going to go back to my roots. I, I, already, I, I always loved writing, even though I thought it was going to be advertising that I did. So I spent the whole summer kind of bouncing around Europe, as it, you're supposed to do, and it wasn't really working out for me. I was kind of like just frustrated with traveling. I was enjoying it, but like having a really hard time. And I wasn't doing the writing that I was supposed to do. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? And I'm going to go back. I'm going to be a failure. And I went to Europe, and I spent all my money. And then I got to this place. And for those of you who have been there, this is uh, Cinque Terre, which is in Italy. And it's kind of like I rolled over the um, border on the train. And I was like, well, that town looks nice. And I jumped off the train. <laughs> And went there, because you can do that there in Europe. Um, so I ended up in this little town, and ended up staying there for, you know, a couple of days. And all of a sudden, I could write. All of a sudden, I was, like, writing little travelogues, and writing about the people I met, and writing, you know, all these little stories, just on my computer, just for myself. And I think it was because of this. I was eating, like, five gelato cones a day. And I can only attribute that to what was going on inside my brain as a creative. It had to be the gelato. What would be the other explanation? So there was like this gelato, and there was like a gelato sandwich with like brioche on either side, if you've ever had this. It's amazing. And this is what I was eating for like breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, midnight snack, whatever, every day. And it transformed my life. So when I came home, I decided I was going to have this new life as a freelance writer. And I named my company Gelato Baby to um, explain that creative feeling that I was having from consuming all those gelatos, like in my stomach. So, of course, when you start a company that's not your actual name, you have to place an ad in the paper as a fictitious name statement. So I put it in the birth section. Um, and I had some people call me, and they're like, are you pregnant? <laughs> like my friends saw it, and they're like, huh? And then I made, I decided I would just go for it with the branding. I would just completely like uh, embrace my new gelato baby life. So instead of business cards, I met this printer one day that was like, I can print on anything on like gelato spoons. So he printed me these amazing uh, business cards with my email on them. And I made like gelato baby swag that I could give to people. These were like iron on patches, which are actually very wonderfully represented in these posters that they made tonight, um, which I'm so honored that my artwork is immortalized in a poster. Um, and these are all made with um, bits of clothing that I had outgrown from eating too much gelato. <laughs> and then I started a blog, which was at first a blog that was supposed to be about gelato, because I was so obsessed with gelato. And I think I've written like maybe like five or six posts about gelato since I started this blog. It didn't really turn out that way, because I was so excited to start writing about all these things that I discovered in Italy, which was cities and the amazing public transportation I was taking and the fact that you could walk everywhere and the fact that there was food being served to you that somebody had, somebody had uh, made, you know, created in their kitchen that they had bought from a farm down the street. And I just really appreciated the, the type of life that I was having there. And I wanted to bring it back and kind of capture it in my blog. And the biggest thing that I started writing about was actually design. It fits all those things, architecture, urban planning, product design, all these things. And of course, I had a really great connection to it from being in advertising and always knowing these creatives who are making these awesome you know, typefaces or posters or whatever. So I started pitching magazines to write stories for them about the people that I had met in the industry who I thought were exceptionally awesome and needed to get the word out about them. So I started pitching the magazines that I read on a regular basis, which I'm sure a lot of you do as well. 
And then I got to pitch bigger magazines. People started to know who I was. And these are people who are, these are magazines who are read by non-designers even, which was super exciting. And then I even got to write design stories in publications that aren't meant for designers, which I thought was a real victory. And that was the most exciting part when actually people around, outside of the, the, the design industry started to care about what people like us do, creatives do. And I was the editor of a blog called Unbeige, um, which was around for, for quite a little bit before me and then is still around today, where I got to write about things like the London Olympic logo was causing seizures in people, apparently, for a while. And I was actually in London last week. It looks good. Like, I said it was bad, but it actually looks really good. And I, everything I said was completely wrong. <laughs> you have to admit that when you're a writer. You're like, sometimes you're wrong. And then I also, at the same time, um, kind of begged and pleaded my way onto a public radio show to be an associate producer. Um, so this is KCRW's Design and Architecture, hosted by Francis Anderton, and it's an amazing show if you, you can podcast it. Um, and I basically said, I don't know anything about radio, let me work for you. And she said, okay. So I ended up uh, working on the show, and I've been working on it ever since. And then the other cool thing is that I've been able to contribute to a lot of books. Um, the New York book on the top left is not a book. You're not, your eyes are not deceiving you. It's actually a deck of cards that shows different architecture walking tours throughout the city. And I've been able to contribute essays to different books that people have asked me to be a part of. Um, this one down here is a Stephen Heller essay collection. So it's just so exciting to be able to write about something I care about and have people read it. Or maybe you don't read it. Maybe you just look at the pictures. It's totally OK. I totally understand. As long as you click on the links or buy the books, it's fine. So another thing that started to emerge during the same time is this whole social design, like the fact that design can solve problems, the fact that design can change the world and make it better. And I really wholeheartedly embrace that. I feel like I was writing about cool chairs for a long time, but then I realized that there was a lot more to the story. Um, and this was kind of a turning point for me. Um, this was my first article for Good, and it was about a group of designers working in Alabama where a third of the population of this county wasn't connected to the water system, the municipal water system. They did not have enough money to pay their bill, so they couldn't put up enough money to actually get the connection to their house. They had satellite television, but they didn't have running water in their house. So this was like a huge, you know, I got to go down on this amazing trip and investigate how these designers were going to solve this problem. They ended up making this beautiful newsprint piece, which turned into this crazy campaign, and they raised about $40,000 to connect people. And it wasn't just they gave people money, they trained them in like debt management and helped them connect them on a very greater level than just giving them running water, which was the most touching thing for me that to know that something I wrote, somebody read, and some, somebody went and donated money. But then I started to write about things like this. This is in Qatar. Does anyone know where that is? Hopefully some. Yeah, so it's in the Middle East. It's not the place that many people have been. Um, this is the proposed uh, stadiums for the World Cup, which is upcoming. And it's all this like crazy, flashy rendering thing that we're used to. The architects in the room are nodding. You know what it's like. It's like these crazy, like, pornographic-like renderings of buildings that will never happen, that look much better than they ever will in real life. And um, the whole thing was that these stadiums were going to be air-conditioned, and they were going to be, um, you know, uh, recycled into these uh, shelters for children or something afterwards. Like, okay, maybe it'll happen. That would be great. But the thing that bothered me more than anything is I wrote an article about this knowing nothing about this country. I was actually on a sports talk radio show, let I, like a call-in show, giving commentary about this. I know nothing about this country. I know nothing about um, who these people are that are you know, funding this stadium. I just felt like it was so weird that I could be sitting at my desk in L.A. and writing with so much authority about a place that I had never been. It wasn't fulfilling to me. It wasn't something that I was interested in doing. I, was, I kind of felt bad about it. I'd much rather write about this pornographic rendering that's actually going to happen in LA and is being built right now. This is a new museum that's, that's actually happening. So I realized it wasn't that I was upset about writing about renderings. I was upset because I wanted to actually go touch it and see it in my own city. 
And then another story like that happened. This was a really amazing story about um, a group of people after the Chinese, the China earthquake, which was, I can't remember what year, but it was a few years ago. Um, all these homes had been devastated, so they built this beautiful public bathhouse so people could come and have hot water and have a sense of community because they just couldn't build the houses fast enough. People were just living in shelters. Beautiful concept, beautifully rendered. Wasn't that excited about writing about it because I felt so bad I had never been here and didn't know anything about the conditions day to day. I didn't know what it was like to live there. Instead, I was excited about writing, writing about this amazing public housing project in LA. This is actually a public housing project, if you can believe it. Absolutely dramatic, gorgeous, designed by Michael Maltzen, where I went here and met these residents. They give you a tour of the building and tell you how the building has changed their lives. And this should have been the coolest thing for me ever to write about, too. This is a skate park in Spain where they have made it really a cool place for the kids to come hang out, and then they have a counseling center embedded into the middle. So they bring the kids here and get them there and having fun. And they're like, hey, do you want to talk about something? Come on in here and hang out when you're done like grinding or whatever you do. Again, like it should have been the most amazing story. But I was way more interested that week in this almost life-size cardboard recreation of an East L.A. street. This is an amazing artist named Anna Serrano who works in L.A. And that to me was like, I wanted to go in here and just sit in here for days and look at all these amazing, look, at she has like a liquor store, she has an ATM, I mean, amazing. She just nailed it in this all cardboard, painted cardboard. So I started to see these patterns in what I was writing about and, and when I liked writing about something, when I got excited about it. And I realized that I was happiest when... I was writing about LA, that was pretty obvious. When I was away from my desk, when it gave me a reason to not just look on someone else's blog and write something on my blog and turn it into another blog or whatever, when it was, I was collaborating with other people. So when I was actually not just me, myself, writing something, when I was actually out there producing an event or trying to make something um, happen with other people. And of course, when I was eating ice cream, this still holds true. This is, it's, it didn't change at all. So I knew, I knew that was another constant that I could keep in my life. So I started asking myself these questions every time I took on a project. Is it local? Is it something in my neighborhood? Can I see it? Can I experience it? Is it something I can go out and do? Does it help my community? Just the way that I had been so concerned about design, being able to bring about social change, are these projects happening right near me in my neighborhood? And do I need ice cream? Again, because sometimes you just need to leave your desk and go have ice cream. Let's be fair. You need to take a break. So a couple years ago, I decided that I was going to focus my work on the place where I lived, which was an interesting strategy for me because I had never chosen LA as this place that I really wanted to be. I thought it was like a really lame place before I moved there. And you also might think it's a lame place, but I can change your mind. And so it wasn't a place that I had particularly felt that I was really in love with, but I felt like if I could focus my energy, I would love it more. And I think that is so true, in, unless you're in a really horrible place. I'm sure there are bad places in the world. But I think if you decide to focus your energy locally, it can really be a huge catalyst in your creative career. So this might be my new character, if you want to think about who I am in my current life. I really don't watch that much television, but I love this show. So what I want to talk about today is a couple of different projects and, of course, getting into the Good Ideas for Cities project that we can hopefully bring to Denver. Um, so here is how serving my city made me happier, healthier, and more creatively fulfilled. And yes, I got to eat more ice cream, too. And that is a part of it. I'm, I'm cautioning you. Find your ice cream, like whatever it is in your life, and you can go out and you can have it every day. It should probably be something healthier, though, not ice cream. Like, you should probably pick something like walking. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. So the first thing I did was I hit the streets, which is, it, it could be your version of anything. Hitting the streets could mean something different for, for any person here. But for me, that meant, in L.A., getting rid of my car, which, if you do that in L.A., people are like, are you okay? Is there anything wrong with you? Like, someone called me once, and they're like, I saw you walking. Is everything okay? <laughs> And I'm, 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 I was okay. Um, so, of course, people don't believe you. It's such as ingrained in your head. Like, I'd love to walk. My name is Walker. It's a very, like, natural part of my life. I was really into it. And when I moved to L.A., everyone said, you have to have a car. You have to drive everywhere. So I just did it. I didn't even question it. That was, I didn't even, like, think there was an alternative. 
So when I got rid of my car and I started telling people that I was walking everywhere, they didn't believe me. So I started taking pictures of myself every time I left the house as like photographic proof that I am actually walking in LA. You will not believe it. So I have all these pictures of my shoes now of, that anyone can, uh, can look at. And other people's shoes, which is an amazing thing about walking, you notice these like lost and abandoned things on the sidewalk, which is a really great reason to get out there and, uh, and stroll around. But something else really interesting happened. I started to see things. It was like I had different eyes. Like I didn't know there was public transportation in LA at all, even though buses like went by and trains, there were train stations. I suddenly started to realize, hey, you know, that's a train. Maybe that could go somewhere where I would want to go and I could get on it and go there. So it's a funny thing when you start to read your city in a different way. And then what I started doing is I started playing with things on Twitter where I could kind of update people to where I was and what I was doing. So I would tell people, I just figured out how to get to the airport for 8.50, and it only took me an hour, and everybody's like, you're lying. But it was absolutely true. Like, it was, a, it was a super easy thing to do, and nobody would believe me. So I would document everything that I did every time I left the house. What, well, not, like, in a way that they could stalk me, but just, like, I'm at the bus stop. It's really hot. Like, I'm waiting for the bus. It took this long. And when I got a bike, I did the same thing. And you should not take pictures of yourself while you're riding your bike on the street. I should not have done this picture. And I, someone com like commented to me that it was dangerous. But I do have a helmet on, as you can see in the, in the shadow. But I started to document that and how a lot of people are really scared to ride their bike in L.A. or any city. And so I started to take pictures of that and say, well, it's not so scary, but you should not do take this picture. And then I started to show people things like how you can take transit, and it's not that bad. I would write longer stories on my blog and you know, tell people that it was safe and clean. And these are things you all know because you live in Denver, and I'm sure a lot more of you take transit than us. Um, and then how you can put your bike on the front of the bus. And I did not even buy my bike to match that bus, but look how good that looks together. <laughs> Swear to God, I did not even think about that. And Instagram, how many people are on Instagram? Instagram is the best because you don't even have to write any words or, and nobody has to read them. And I know as a writer, I probably shouldn't say that, but people love looking at pretty pictures. So I take pictures of coming out of the subway station and people are, make comments and say such wonderful things. It's such a great community. And the funny thing is, I started to realize that people, I just thought I was kind of pushing this information out, like, read it if you want, but people were getting really passionate about this kind of stuff. So I posted this picture and said, um, this is the worst LA intersection. I've nominated it. I absolutely hate it. It's like the, it takes like three hours to cross a, the sidewalk, to cross the crosswalk here. And all these people commented, like, that's not the worst intersection. The one is by me. I hate that one, too. And I couldn't believe how many people were actually paying attention and that I could start a dialogue as, as simply as putting something on Facebook and people would start talking about it. And then there's things like this where people tweet something that, you know, I wrote, like an article I wrote or something, and they might be inspired to walk more. I mean, that would be amazing if that's actually how I was able to affect the city and the people who live there. And then some people like on Instagram take pictures of their own feet and tag me on Instagram, which is amazing. We can start this like group of people who take pictures of their feet when they're walking around. I hadn't expected that at all. And my one friend um, messaged me on Facebook to tell me that he got rid of his car because I inspired him to do so. But I saw him the other day and he actually gave up and got a Prius. But um, <laughs> he tried it for like six months. So that's, I'll take it. Like that was pretty good. He, everybody, you know, I'm not against cars. Like sometimes you need cars. It's okay. So I ended up realizing that I have become a pedestrian advocate. And there aren't uh, there isn't an organized group of pedestrian, pedestrian advocates in LA, believe it or not. So um, with a few other all women, as a matter of fact, we founded this group called, called Los Angeles Walks. And we decided that we would do everything we could to make walking safe, accessible, and fun in LA. And people were so excited about it. People like, all, like came out of the woodwork to this amazing party that we had. And it was a karaoke party, because I love karaoke. And we decided to... Um, play off the song, Walking in L.A., where the refrain is, of course, Nobody Walks in L.A., by having singing all the other songs that are about walking that we could come up with, so like, Walk This Way, you know, These Boots Are Made for Walking, and kind of show that there were other, so many other great songs about walking in L.A. that we could, like, fight that song down. So we had this amazing karaoke fundraiser where everybody was singing songs about walking. It was so, so fun. Who knew there were so many people that cared about walking and karaoke at the same time? 
Somebody actually thought it was a walking karaoke party where you like do like a mobile karaoke unit would like go like down the street, which would also be awesome. So the crazy thing is, and I think this is true when you focus your energy on something. You know, I wasn't getting paid for any of that stuff I was doing at all. Um, these were just kind of like side projects I was interested in. But people started hiring me to write articles about this stuff. This is not particularly my the specialization that I had up until this point. Th these were people who were like, I just saw that you wrote something about public transit. Can you write a story about public transit? And I was like, sure. So if you do something long enough, people will start to recognize you for it, and then they will hire you to do that for real money that you can deposit in your bank account, which is amazing. So now my lifestyle that I wanted to have was actually being paid for by these articles that I wanted to write. And a really exciting thing happened uh, two weeks ago. I told you I worked on that radio show. I kind of clawed my way onto a radio show. And I learned a little bit about producing radio over the years. And um, two weeks ago, my first segment that I produced myself um, aired on public radio. Um, and it was really exciting for me. And it's a little bit long. It's seven minutes long. And I know you have nothing to look at here because it's radio. But you can like, close your eyes and like lean back. I'm going to play it only because it really shows how far I've come. It, it talks about my whole journey about talking about walking in LA. And I think you'll enjoy it. I hope it's entertaining. So um, this is for this show, Studio 360, which I'm sure a lot of you know, which is an amazing uh, show based out of New York, of all places. So the fact that they would let me talk about walking in LA is pretty great. And um, it's hosted by Kurt Anderson, so I'm going to play it now. Back in the day, you were a new way to pop from this in person to the big on the new cable channel on TV.
a deep song. Then why don't the song go away? One of the most stellar characters of that play is that the people who move here have less of a desire to walk into one another's city. I've always thought that was ridiculous. That's Christopher Hawthorne. He's the architecture critic in the Los Angeles Times. I think what's different is that the city doesn't lend itself to walk in. Often makes it difficult for people to walk. Los Angeles once had the best public transit system in the world, with a massive network of trolleys. But in the last few years, LA began to prioritize cars over walkers. Streets were designed for speed. Who heard about sidewalks? As the 20th century wore on, we kind of redesigned our little bars, almost making them like miniature freeways. We, we made them friendlier and friendlier to cars. So when you can update, Phrase, nobody walks in LA to be appropriate for 2012. What would you update it to? Everybody wants to walk in LA. Secretly or not, people don't like to admit it. And I think the question is how much the city is going to respond or even respect that desire in the future. So if the phrase nobody walks in LA is out of date, then it's time for a new slogan. One that shows the speed of change you want. One that expresses his work kind of fed up. <laughs> I guarantee you'll have that in your head for the rest of the night. You're welcome. So that, to me, just a, I don't have a slide to go along with what I'm going to say right now, but I, I just think that reaching people in an entertaining way to send a message about something that you care about is one of the most important things we can do as creatives. Like you're in your car, well, you're probably in your car listening to the radio, maybe your uh, your computer. But the fact that I could get somebody to think about how your sidewalks are designed, that you should be able to dem demand safer streets in your city. Um, but I did it in a way that wasn't just like preachy and wonky and boring. It was something that you might actually want to listen to, and I think that's a huge huge key and something that I was so luckily be able, luckily been able, have been able to do with this radio segment. So thanks for listening. That was the first time I played it live. So. <laughs>
I just love radio so much. We can talk about this later if you want to nerd out about radio. So the second thing, the second change I made was another really interesting uh, pr uh, process that I went through and a really interesting experience that I had. And that is to change your perspective. And I talked about how walking instantly changed my perspective. That was a no-brainer. Like, it just changes the way you think about the world. But this was something a little bit different. So two years ago, I was actually picked to be um, a fellow for the USC Annenberg Getty Arts Journalism Program, which is a really awesome, prestigious fellowship that takes place in LA. It's all about Los Angeles. And I was named a fellow one year, and then the next year I was invited back as part of this special project uh, where it gathered all these arts journalists together to try to figure out some different ways to present arts journalism, kind of like the story I just uh, showed you, just ways to get arts journalism and get out in the world and get more people to pay attention to it. Because as we all know, museums are having a hard time. Newspapers are having a hard time. Everybody's having a hard time. I mean, sorry, this museum is doing great. Um, they have no problems at all, but you should still join and be a member of the museum um, and every other organization. Um, so part of what we got to do was this amazing cultural um, immersion in Los Angeles, which included going to Disneyland, believe it or not. They took us to study Disneyland with some urban planners for the day, which was so cool. We got to go backstage Disneyland, if you ever get to do that. It's amazing. I can't tell you anything that I saw back there. Um, so this was just a really great program that I was honored to be a part of with all these great arts journalists. And so what we were pressed into service to do for arts journalism is come up with some different ways um, to get people engaged and present these projects on this website that we published at the end of our time. So our team was really interested in public transit. We kind of, they put the teams together based on interests that we had and the members of our team were all really interested in things like public transit and walking. So we came up with, after, you know, kind of reporting on foot, you know, we, we vowed not to take cars when we were doing our reporting. We took the train and the bus and bikes everywhere that we went, and we found, we figured out how to fa find stories by going out on the streets. We did not take any story leads from sitting in our computer and looking at blogs, which is how all those stories that I told you about that frustrated me came from, like, somebody posted on a blog, and then my editor sent it to me and said, you should write about this. And I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I'd rather discover something organically on my own. So what we came up with is this idea that getting there is half the story. And if you think about it, there's a really interesting part of journalism history. Um, the fact that you had a beat, right? And cops, same thing. You had a beat, and it, was, it meant that the place that you walked on foot and patrolled every day and found out what stories were going on there, which, of course, nobody does that anymore. So it's kind of returning to that that the idea of a beat, the idea that you'd be walking or covering a, a geographic area, not just like you're, you know, typing something into Google. And another big thing that we looked at was this idea of a, like m mimicking the slow food movement, something like slow journalism. How, what is it like to like not be cranking out like 30 blog posts a day and actually being focused on a story, finding a story, meeting all the right people in your neighborhood and reporting on it? So we came up with this manifesto. Um, things like covering a beat, things like being flexible. If we see something that catches our eye, we're not going to go to the museum opening. We're going to go deal with what's going on that we see happening, like graffiti artists like doing an amazing piece on the corner. So it was all about that, those serendipitous moments that you get when you're having public transit. And being able to talk to people on the bus. I've gotten so many story ideas from hearing people complain about something on the bus, people from different backgrounds for me that I would have never, ever had a chance to meet in my life. And so this was part of what we wanted to um, called this street journalism movement. So after the fellowship, I was like, I got to start doing this. Like, I, I need to go out and walk my beat and figure out what's happening. And so one of the first stories that I came across was these new bus benches that were a couple blocks from my house. And I was like, the other ones were super ugly. They were like molded plastic. Um, and these were so shiny and beautiful. I was like, oh, this is great. Like, the city cares about bus riders. I'm, I'm totally going to write a story about this. And I pitched the story to um, the LA Weekly, which is like Alternative Weekly. You have, you know, there's a million in every city. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And he was so excited. The editor there was like, yeah, let's write, like, you do a column on, like, public design, like, urban design. Like, what's on the street? Like, what do people see? What do people have questions about? So I started this column where I could write about things like this, which was exactly what I, you know, what I wanted to do. The sad thing that I found out about these bus benches was I, something that I don't think anyone in LA knows. So 
buses, bus benches aren't actually paid for by the city. They're paid for by advertising companies. And I don't know if this is the same in every place. I didn't know this. Um, and they actually don't put them in places in low-income neighborhoods because they don't want low-income people to look at their ads. They think that rich people should look at their ads. So it completely doesn't make any sense for where they are. There's bigger shade structures in nicer neighborhoods where they can put more advertising on the sides when actually more people are waiting at the buses in the lower income neighborhoods. So I uncovered this crazy story that, that was right under my nose the whole time that I had never knew anything about. And so many people were emailing me being like, I had no idea that this is what it was like in our city. And this is another great example of, this was a place I used to live by when I lived in Hollywood. I've since moved to a different neighborhood called Silver Lake. Um, and this is what it used to look like when uh, I, I lived by this alley. I would walk by this place all the time and be like, what the hell is going on in there? Like, you just knew there was some, like, business. And I was just so mortified, but, like, I didn't know where to begin to get this, you know, I wasn't as civically minded back then, but I didn't know where to begin to get this cleaned up. And this amazing group um, who are re transforming these alleyways in Hollywood and turning them into these be beautiful places for outdoor dining or just walking where they have little like street festivals. Can you believe, like, I mean, just look at that. Like, that is the same alley, I swear to God. But this was another example of like something I would never have noticed if I hadn't been walking down the street and, and peeked into this alley. And now other cities are able to, um, or other parts of LA can uh, figure out how to do this because they made a little toolkit that said, this is how you do this. This is how you transform an alley, which was absolutely amazing. This is gonna make such a big difference in LA. And one day I walked by this boat uh, in the middle of, it's not nowhere near the beach in LA. This is in Koreatown. And I was like, okay, what's up with that? So I started thinking about it a little more when I pitched it to my editor, and he was like, well, actually, there are a lot of bars in Koreatown that have this weird, like, nautical theme. Can you get to the bottom of it? And I was like, I absolutely can, because it required going to all the bars and drinking there for an entire night. So here's another one that has all these, like, you know, tall ships dancing down the middle of it. And then we got to do a lot of great research, which I thought was, like, incredibly important to the story. And so I got to write this amazing story about the same thing that people have wondered for years, walking down the street, seeing that boat, walking by all these restaurants. Why are there so many pirates, pirate bars in Koreatown? And I think that that was, it was like, who gets to write about going to pirate bars, first of all? Awesome. Um, but just that there was a fact that it's something that I'd wondered about for so many years, and I got to get to the bottom of it. And it's a long story. You can either read it or I'll tell you in more detail. Um, but basically, it's like... Korean people are crazy, and they love to party, but, and it, they're so fun. It's a great place to go. And this is at the bottom of my street, actually. I live up where those palm trees kind of go over the hill at the top over there. This was a really super controversial thing that happened in L.A., um, as you can imagine, because we're terrified of um, not driving. Um, so this was a little street that they, of like a, not even a full block, that they closed off just like they have in places like Times Square. I'm sure they've done a lot of it here in Denver, and they turned it into what they call a parklet or an urban plaza. The people who uh, lost their parking spaces, there, no, no people lost their parking spaces, but the fact that they were losing parking spaces made people go nuts. And they only lost four parking spaces. So I have a feeling it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but people were like protesting it. There was a guy at the opening like screaming death to the um, one of the people that were, that were giving a talk. Like it was it was really super controversial. So for me, this was a chance for me to show, you know, why you know be critical and say well, why should we why should we have this here? It is important, but to actually get into a lot of the issues and talk to a lot of the business owners. And I actually figured out that the thing that people were actually more upset about, and this was a really interesting thing about a lot of public spaces. I think people are, are, have grown to love it. They actually really hated the color. They called it like vomit and like puke green. It's not that bright, but it, it was kind of at the beginning. People were upset that the business owners had to have so much responsibility in bringing these chairs and tables in and out every day. And I think that's a valid concern, actually, to put so much you know, responsibility on these business owners to have to haul this furniture out. If something went wrong, they had to clean it up. If something happened, they were kind of responsible. So I think it's like being critical also about what the city's doing and making sure that people can have an open conversation about what bothers them about it. But of course, I was just excited because I had a matching dress that I could wear to the opening, and then I met this girl that had another matching dress. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in favor of it, but I, w I really wanted to make sure that the community's concerns were addressed. 
Addressed, get it? Dress. So this was another thing that happened, which was the same thing. I really wanted to get to the bottom of why this was happening. Um, this is a bar that uh, decided to add this outdoor patio into the front of their uh, building. And instead of like building a nice outdoor patio like you can see next door, they put up a six-foot wall around where the people would all be hanging out which I thought was pretty lame because you kind of want to see people that are hanging out at night and like they might want to see out and like not be stuck behind this wall. And the business owner said that um, he, the, it was a very sensitive area where pe the lights were very bright at night and people didn't, he didn't want people to have too much light in their eyes and that he didn't want people to have to see cars go by or people walking by who might not be like, you know, acceptable to them, which basically meant that he was really worried that like, homeless people might walk by, or like kids, or whatever. So but to me, that's a part of the vibrancy of the street. You want to be able to see other people's faces. You want to know it's safe. You want to see people drinking. You want to know that people or places are open. That all just makes it a great place to hang out. But instead, he made this like jail for his um, drinkers to sit behind. I really disagreed with this. And I investigated all the parts of the story. And I came out firmly, firmly against it. And basically offered some ideas in my story about what we could do, like chopping the, the wall off halfway just so you could see people's heads, cutting some holes in it maybe just so you could like breathe and like see outside. Um, I, I thought there were some, you know, different things that, you know, we could try and maybe he would be, you know, open to these ideas. And the way that you know when you write a story that's really good and that you have a great point of view is when you get hate mail. There were comments that were longer than the article itself, making comments about me, like really personal things about, about me, like um, you know this, this one, for, for example, says that you would dare write such a blasphemous article without offering any creative alternative ideas to what you're bitching about makes me laugh at you, Miss Walker. The whole article was about creative alternative ideas that I had. So then a bunch of people commented, pro and con, which is good, like healthy dialogue is great. Then she comments again, same girl, and she said, uh, I, for one, work for change, work for justice, and until Miss Walker comments herself, it's all rhetoric nonsense. I had commented, like, a little bit above her comment, um, so she actually wasn't reading the story in any way or any of the comments. I think she was just, like, getting on there. Um, and then my other favorite comment was, um, I'm sorry, Alyssa Walker, I've been meaning to stop following on Twitter, and I'm really going to do it after I'm done posting this. You write about the most insignificant hipster matter. And I like how he put parentheses around hipster, just to like, you know, de-emphasize that a little bit. And I can't believe he would stop following me on Twitter. That really hurts my feelings. That's the saddest thing ever. So I think this is a really good lesson in when you have a point of view, when you speak your mind, when you um, stand up for yourself and what you believe in, uh, people start to pay attention. I've gotten so much, so many emails from people, of course that were positive. I love the hate mail, it's great, I like keep it all in this folder, like hate mail. Um, but I think a lot of people wrote to me and said, thank you for saying something about this, this what this guy did was wrong. And then some, some editors wrote to me and they're like, can you write an opinion piece about something else? So I think showing that you have, especially for a writer, showing that you have this critical eye and a point of view is super important. So practicing this street journalism, I really do get my ideas from the street, but I'm also able to sh talk about the kind of city that I want to live in and what it should look like. And the restaurant owner, by the way, has now added a curtain above the wall. <laughs> I can't win on them all, obviously, but... So my final lesson, perhaps, uh, tonight is to get out and meet the people who are in your community, much like you're doing here tonight. I think you guys know this for this one. You probably know all these. So it's probably just reiterating things that you know. So this goes back to actually four years ago, like pretty much right, I think it might have actually been like today, four years ago. And my friend who, um, I was talking to a graphic designer friend of mine who had done a lot of work for a campaign, a presidential campaign. And he basically said, like, what am I going to do with myself now? Like, he had volunteered every day for, like, two or three months. He had, you know, had, like, a bake sale fundraiser. He had done all this stuff, you know, for, for all these months, tried to get his, his candidate elected. And then he was like, I don't even know if I can go back to my job now because I am so into this. Like, I'm so into democracy, and I'm so into, like, working for my community. But he didn't really understand what to do next, because I think that's really true about the election year. Like, everybody gets so excited about voting and all this stuff, and then the rest of the time we're like, ah, 
eh, you know, they're not gonna like do many other things for our community, but voting somehow brings that out in a lot of people. So I kind of was thinking about what he said, and I was like, well, I think you could volunteer, or like, this was kind of before AIJ was a lot more coalesced in, in this design for good thing that we're gonna talk about tomorrow. Um, there just wasn't anything I could think of to point him towards. I was like, I don't know, like make a poster for something that you like, or I don't know, like put it up, or you know. I, I didn't know what, what advice to give him. And at the same time, I was writing a lot of articles for good. I was writing a lot of articles actually about LA, um, going to City Hall a lot, going to a lot of meetings about transportation, going to a lot of meetings about this food policy council that was launching right around the same time. And I kind of realized that I was in all these meetings with like city leaders and they were like, oh, we'd love to have a campaign that could get people to buy local vegetables. And I'd sit there and be like, oh yeah, that sounds good. And then like two weeks later, I was like, duh, the designer could like work with the food policy people and they would, he would have something to do. I did not put it together in my head because it doesn't seem like something that, it does, it, we just don't think of th that kind of way of solving problems. We have clients, and then sometimes we do independent stuff, but we don't really think of going to our cities and being like, hey, totally overwhelmed city council person, what can I do for you? And it's usually like, can you file all these papers for us? Which is totally, that's fine. But I think it's using creative problem solving, which is what a lot of these groups need. They are so, they don't have any money, they, they don't have any time, and they're just dealing with the same bureaucrats over and over. They don't really look outside of their own groups to try to get help for the, the causes that they're working on. Meanwhile, all these creatives are super interested in helping, but they don't know where to go. And I think one thing that I've learned, especially writing about design, especially write about gra writing about graphic design for the last few years, is that designers are really, really good at this kind of work. And I'm not actually talking about you know, things like designing a poster. I mean, that, those are, things are good, part of campaigns, things like that are great. But they actually are just really good at solving problems, like social problems or you know, physical problems, infrastructural problems, because they can, like, like I said, they can explain complex concepts in a visually intriguing way that elicits buy-in and inspires action. That's what you guys do as designers. That's like your charge. But applying it in a non-traditional way to help your city. So we came up with this event at Good. So this was in December of 2008. We ended up having the event. And we matched all these designers that we really admired with city problems that, that the city was facing, like stuff that urban leaders had told us were big problems. And they presented the solutions at this live event. We had this big party, tons of booze, of course. And it was one of the, it was one of the greatest events that I had been to. And I'm not just saying that because I planned it. But it, it was good, I mean, but it was because we got a bunch of different people in the room. It was because we got people from, you know, the transit agency, and we got people who were design, like print designers, and we got people from the Food Policy Council. Everybody who doesn't normally talk to each other, who really cares about their city, was all in one place. So soon, other cities started asking us if we could bring it there. And we didn't anticipate this at all. We were like, let's just do this in LA, maybe something will come out of it, it'll be fun. So San Francisco called us up, New York called us up, D design schools started calling us up and asking us to create a curriculum, which we did with a group of um, professors so they could do this with their students, which was amazing. But the students had like the best ideas because they're crazy and they were like, there was like no limits for them. They were just like, we're going for it. So last year, it was super exciting because we got a grant. And I've never gotten a grant before, but it's amazing. You write something and people give you money, like a lot more money than just an article. It, I highly recommend it. So this, our place is this new group uh, that funds creative placemaking. And so it's the NEA plus 11 different foundations, like people like the Rockefeller Foundation that you've probably heard of. And this first year, they gave out 11.5 million to 34 projects across the country. And ours was one of them. We got $85,000, which is the most money I've ever managed in my life. It's kind of scary. So uh, we launched the program. We had called it all different things, depending on what city wanted to call what event. So we launched it as Good Ideas for Cities. And I have a little quick video that just kind of explains what we did. Hi, my name is Melissa Walker.
So we managed to actually take it to six cities. Uh, we stretched the budget. I stayed at a lot of friends' houses in different places, and we managed to squeeze a little bit more money out of the budget. We managed to go to six cities, and we had these incredible, incredible events in all these different places. Um, we had about six groups present in each um, city, and we had about, you know, of course, about six leaders who came forward and, and, present, and proposed these challenges that they were supposed to address. Here are just a couple slides from all the different places we went. And such engaged, excited people about the future of where they lived. It was, it's like the most inspiring thing I've ever done. That's me with the mayor of Portland, Portlandia. Have you guys watched the show? So he actually plays um, the mayor's assistant on the show. Kyle McLaughlin is the actual mayor. So he was like introducing himself to me. I wanted to be like, yeah, I know, you're the mayor's assistant. But I didn't say that because I thought that would be rude. But he actually, I think he would have liked the joke. He was very funny. And we partnered with all these organizations. This was the most incredible part. Like, all these groups wanted to be a part of what we were doing. Every city that we went to, they just came out of the woodwork. And if you notice, we worked with AIGA chapters in every single city. That was not something that we went out, um, you know, that wasn't, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of AIGA. I've been involved in a long, for a long time. But they all came to us. They found out what we were doing. And they're like, we want to be a part of this, which just says so much about AIGA and what they're doing. So we had these great events. Also, we had these amazing, uh, these were these notebooks that they made in Portland as well, which is like, more rain, free tacos. So we had all these events, and these are just kind of like some stats for, for what we um, achieved throughout the year. And I just want to quickly show you some of my, I won't say favorites because they're all my favorites, but these are some that I think you might be interested in. This was in New Orleans where I guess they have the same problem we have in LA where there's not any bus shelters or bus benches anywhere. So this was an idea for uh, local business owners to just transform their street corner to be a dignified place for people to wait for the bus. And what they did that was so amazing is they found one business owner that agreed to do this and said, how much would you spend on something like this? And he gave them a figure, and they came up with a kit that fit the budget exactly. So they're now building this one and also showing this kit to people who could, business owners could do this in front of their place. There's like a lending library there, which I think is really cool. This was, of course, from Portland. It's a pedal-powered parking meter. So if you park there, you can't pay money for it. You have to pedal to put time on it. So maybe you could like grab somebody if you didn't if you like were like didn't feel like riding your bike, like somebody could be there just like ready to exercise and putting putting time on everybody's meter. Of course this would come out of Portland. It's just so amazing. There's so many benefits to this. It's, we should make this happen for sure. This was something in Dallas, which I it was so simple, and that's the beautiful thing about these events, is the ideas are so simple. And they have this really cool um, trail system, which is for bikers and, and walkers. It's kind of like an urban trail that kind of runs through um, different parts of the city. The problem is nobody knows where it goes. It says, like, on a map it goes here or, or here or here, but they don't understand from the map or the wayfinding. You know, it just points to, like, a neighborhood or, you know, on the map it's, like, goes close to the street, but they don't know. So they came up with a map that is more like a subway map. So it tells you all the different nodes where you meet up with different streets or different landmarks. And so you would actually know, oh, I take the pink line a few stops, and I exit, and I can get to my destination instead of trying to figure out how to get from one place to another. Brilliant. And they're actually working on implementing this. This was a really cool idea from, from Cincinnati to get transit to be more social. So what we're, it kind of came from the idea that when you're on the bus, you might want to know what other buses other people are on, and maybe you might want to meet up with them, because transit's the cool thing about transit is that you know serendipity and schedules change, and maybe you'd be like, hey, I am downtown, you want to grab a drink? So you'd actually like check into your bus, um, you could be like a mayor of a bus, you know, you could do things where you could show people where you are and hopefully connect with other riders, or maybe like meet somebody that you might start dating or something, it could be, you know, on the bus. This was a great idea from St. Louis where there's a really huge problem with uh, vacant buildings in St. Louis, much like Detroit, but it's not as well known. Uh, and this was just a really simple idea to get high school kids to adopt these buildings and turn them into centers where they could learn basic um, like woodworking skills, carpentry skills, interior design, and local firms would help sponsor them to like turn these into community centers, but they would also get this real vocational on the ground training. And this one I of course loved. This is the big idea was how to get more people to fight obesity by walking. 
And they decided that if kids can get hooked on walking when they're young, then they'll grow up to be healthy adults who love to walk. So this is a series of kid-led walking tours where you could have a kid lead you to like their favorite like rope swing in the neighborhood or their favorite ice cream place. And you could join their tour and they would take you out into their neighborhood and show you, you know, what, where their favorite place to walk is. And this one was really great because it also was implemented. They just did it on their own. They didn't even ask us if they could do it or should do it. This was a group in New Orleans as well where they decided that they looked, focused at the most dangerous uh, corridor for biking in the city where the most accidents had, occur, had occurred. Because, of course, <laughs> those trolleys just come down. There's like no, nothing protecting you from those trolleys. It's a little scary, especially when you've had too many hurricanes. And so... They made this signage that would make people aware that bikers were using this area and also would make bikers more safe and more visible. And they also ended up making an app that would help you transition from the bus or the trolley to the bike route. So it was like, how do you get here from one, from one part of the city to another? And they made them, and they hung them up all through the neighborhoods that they, this corridor goes through. And they're still up, I hear. Um, the people who made the signs for them are the people who make real signs for the city, and they were so excited about the idea that they gave them materials for, like, nothing. So this was just, like, I'm sure the, it's not, uh, we shouldn't, like, condone this for the city. You know, don't go put up your own fake signage, especially if it's misleading. But the city was really excited about it. They're like, someone took the initiative, and I, I think what will happen is they'll start to implement it and figure out a way how to adapt this for real. So we took all these ideas and we put them all online. You can watch videos of every single team presenting their concepts. And you can follow us um, on Twitter or go to the website and check them all out. But the really interesting thing that happened was not anything that we did at all. Like we just had these events and then we, we go into town, then I leave town, I'm like, later. And what happened is they all ran with it. All these cities ran with it on their own without any more money from us, without any more you know, input from us. They're like, guess what we're going to do? So in Portland, there's a really interesting challenge that I feel like might be maybe similar in Denver. There's actually not that many people who live in the proper city of Portland who have school-age kids at all. It's either people who have waited a long time to have kids or they already had their kids and they're, you know, they're not plugged into elementary school, high school you know, activities at all. So it was how to get, and more people are choosing not to have kids, of course. So it was how to connect those people with the school system and get them into the public schools. A lot of people didn't even know their local public school when they asked people. And that's, that's a real travesty to me, I think. So what they did is they held this hackathon where they brought all these groups, um, the developers and uh, web programmers, into this space. And they said, OK, we're going to spend the day working on technology solutions that are going to help connect people to their local schools. And here's all the hackers hacking all day. The mayor came and supported the whole day. All the unified school people came, which was really amazing. And there's actually several tools that are actually being produced right now. Um, one's like a Facebook app that kind of reminds you about local events happening in your local school. As simple as that. You know, a lot of these schools don't even have Facebook pages. They don't, they don't think about that kind of technology solution. So there was a lot of great solutions that came out of them, and a lot of them have full support of the local schools. This was in St. Louis, where I told you that I grew up, and so I had a special affinity for um, uh, going there. And I, this one's really exciting because it's really moving forward and quickly. Again, the problem with St. Louis is a lot of it is vacant lots in downtown, um, in a, a lot of ab abandoned buildings, vacant lots. People are still really scared to be downtown in St. Louis, even though there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on. So their idea was a series of beacons that would be in the center of every neighborhood. There's like um, 37 neighborhoods in downtown um, St. Louis. And, so, and they're very small. They're very small and close-knit. So you would go see one of these beacons, and it lights up based on pedestrian activity around it. So it knows when people are there. So you can't say, like, oh, nobody's there, because they're, you could see on, like, a map online, like, yes, there's people walking there. Like, there's tons of people in this neighborhood. There was a parade here. And then it also picks up and gathers, like, any tweets, any, like, Facebook posts, any Foursquare check-ins, and just shows the activity whoa, of what's happening in that area. But what I think it does, and it kind of subliminally, is it just makes it feel safer. You can kind of see from one place to another. The neighborhoods are so small. Oh, they also have free Wi-Fi. I don't know if I mentioned that. You could actually see to the next neighborhood and see how far away that is. So it kind of gives you the sense of like, oh, it's safe to go to that place. There's people there. Like, I know, I know how far it is from one neighborhood to another. And these guys, a bunch of them quit their jobs, incorporated, 
and have built a prototype. They're working with this lighting designer and this programming guy um, who does like a lot of these cool gaming programs. And they're actually doing it with the full support of the mayor. They have one prototype that's probably going to go in a neighborhood called The Loop. And the business owner is totally willing to make sure that it's not going to get screwed up um, <laughs> or defaced or anything, because we all would depend on those bus local business owners. And um, this is actually going to be something that I think is going to happen in St. Louis. And I couldn't be more excited, because I really do think it, it shows that they thought a lot about what people want to have in St. Louis, and that is a sense of safety and knowing that people are out there having fun, which is, is, is happening, but you want to be able to visualize it. You want to be able to see it. And this was also one of the most touching um, solutions for me because it originated in L.A. at one of those very early events. Um, this was a really interesting challenge that came to us because it was a homelessness group um, that works to get people off the streets. And, you know, we go to these urban leaders and we kind of have this meeting with them and we say, okay, tell us what do you need? And they're like, can you help us get all this paperwork off of our desk? And we're like, well, yes. Uh, get, you know, can you be a little bit more specific? And they're like, look at our process of getting someone off the streets and into transitional housing. It's like 168 steps. So people are out there, volunteers are going through this pile of paperwork. Oh, have you had a TB test? Yes. Have you ever been in jail? No. And basically just going through this step-by-step -step process of just, you know, signing all these things. So we assigned it to a furniture designer, of all people. Um, <laughs> we like to give a little bit of a challenge here and, like, twist things up. And she was just really intimidated at first. She's like, I, you know, I don't know where to start. But she had actually worked at a shelter um, when she lived in Tijuana. And so she had this really unique insight into this crazy bureaucracy that, that manages to permeate all of our um, social services, sadly. So what she created was a board game. And again, like gaming is like such a big thing in, in all these solutions. Um, this was a way to train their volunteers. And what, it would ha what you would do is in each city, you would find out what are these like 100, 168 steps that are lined up here. And they would have these boot camp events where the volunteers would realize what steps could, they could take out in their community. Because all communities are different. You know, everything's a little bit, you know, different laws and things like that. They would figure out what steps they could take out. So groups would work together. And if they had, like, a place, like, see the yellow, like, square where they're, like, they're not sure, they would raise their hand and somebody would come and be like, oh, yeah, you have to do that before you do that. And then they would have this great interactive process where they would streamline this for their community, for, for going out and volunteering. So here you can see them again working. This is how them in action. Um, so what they would do is take all these 168 steps and reduce them into fewer steps. It's different in every community. They launched one in LA. They also did one in New York. They've done some in other cities. But what they told us was absolutely amazing. Across the board, we asked them, like, what do you think we, what do you, how do you much do you think we helped? And they said, after they've been using it to train their volunteers, it cuts processing time in half, which is absolutely amazing. I mean, we couldn't have even imagined that this would be something that would be on that scale, 50% more people, we would guess, are getting, being able to get into uh, transitional housing because of this solution. And I really love what this New York Times writer said when he wrote about it. If a one-day process can spark big improvements in the way cities handle housing, what other government functions could be reimagined over shoots and ladders like game boards? So like, taxes? Let's make a board game. Like, <laughs> voting? Really sucks. Like, let's fix it. And he totally understood that we want people to steal these ideas. Like, we would love it if the government would, would use this to train their volunteers or, or, or whatever. Um, whoever's working in government, they are volunteers, but they get paid. But I think that it's a really great point that he made. We want people to take these ideas and take them to their communities. So a really exciting thing happened um, earlier this year. We got picked as one of 124 projects to represent the US at um, the Biennale, Architecture Biennale. This was an incredible honor. These are a lot of projects that I had written about throughout the years. They're all urban grassroots interventions that are improving cities. And the, the group, the, the exhibition was called Spontaneous Interve Interventions, which was very apt because a lot of them didn't have funding. They were a lot of the guerrilla um, spirit of the bike thing that I just showed you. People were just out there solving problems in their community and being like, I just did that, you know, thanks. You know, really, really smart ideas. So the Biennale is held in Venice, Italy, of all places, which is the best city for walking. There are no streets at all. There's no cars. It's just a place where you walk around. 
And they also totally ascribed to this slow, they, they started slow food, but this slow journalism that we were talking about, this street journalism, like walking around, talking to people, eating food that's grown locally, you know, really getting out and meeting your neighbors. And they have really interesting solutions to city problems. Like, this is from a, like a couple of days ago when they had crazy floods in St. Mark's Square. People just put on these waders and just keep going on with life as if nothing ever happened, which I think is an amazing thing and a little scary, but they look cute. So we got to have an event um, in Venice at the Biennale, which was an incredible honor. This is the deputy mayor of uh, Venice giving an introduction and, and talking about how he was going to steal all the ideas for Venice, and we were like, yes, do it. And then we got to be at part of the exhibition. Um, you can see us number 44. Uh, it's actually on the floor, it's not on the wall, so you could like walk all over our names, which is kind of cool. And then the ex exhibition was so beautiful, the way they had designed it, you could pull down these little banners that showed you the information about the project. So it was kind of like you were creating your own urban intervention by, by yanking down on it. It was so low tech and so DIY and so true to the spirit of all the projects. And so many of our friends were there. It was like we were running into other Americans in every corner because there were 124 projects. Most other countries only brought like one or two projects. So it was like we invaded Venice. So there is me um, with our banner giving the information about our whole initiative. And I think the best part about this was that um, after I got married, this is where I got to go on my honeymoon, and it was paid for. And I think that that is the real goal that you should reach in your life, is when you can get your honeymoon paid for somehow by work. And believe it or not, I think it all does come back to gelato because I started on this path a long time ago when I was back in Italy and trying to figure out what I should do with my life. And would you believe that my life brought me back to Italy again with all this new information that I had in my life and was able to uh, present this great project that was, had started when I was walking those same cobblestone streets. So I think the lesson of my talk is that you should all eat more ice cream. And that is good for me. Thank you. So I think we're going to have a Q&A now. And someone has mics that they will bring to you if you have a question. Does anyone have a question? There's one right there, this woman. You can get, that's my aunt who's going to the bathroom right now. That's her friend Jane. <laughs> that's where I learned how to drink beer from was my aunt, Karen. I think for the Good Ideas for Cities project, um, having good, the publication, which I, I think you're probably most, some of you are most familiar with it, I think having good behind it was kind of validated it for them, and they were like, oh, we, we know that, who they already partner with, we know who advertises there, we know what they're about. So I think that that maybe re relieves some of that an, you know, anticipation or anxiety that they might have had about working with us. I think what, the thing that we did is we went to each city and we, we had two hosts. We had two organizations that acted as hosts. And it was people who had either reached out to us and said that they wanted to be a part of it or was someone who we just knew were doing good work in the cities. And we, we just asked as many people as we could who would be good hosts. You know, we just, we, we put our feelers out. Um, I had some personal connections to different cities. I honestly would say that the AIGA chapters were the most helpful in connecting us with different groups. And... That, I ha I, again, like I'm a big fan of AIJ, I know they're great, but I think the, the, the connections that they made for us in each city were like the best. They like got us the venue. Like they, would, they, would do, they were so connected and they were so great. So I think it's like finding, finding a group that is well-respected, yes, it, which is tough, but like you have to get somebody that already is thinking on that level. And a lot of people who, 
had never had any contact with their local government or hadn't, you know, didn't even like really have a relationship with the mayor. Those were people that we, we couldn't work with because we wanted to have that top level, you know, connection. So I think that maybe going to someplace like the mayor's office, they might have like some kind of advisory group of people or they might have some nonprofits that they already work with. Ours is really, does a really good job. I'm sure Denver has the same kind of thing where they have people that they trust and, and know who to work with. But again, like I, I feel like having good behind us was really important and I'm happy to share you know, any of the people we've heard about in Denver. I'm not sure, you know, they, anyone could probably answer that and, and go, this is what this event is for. So you could go talk to each other about that kind of stuff. Um, but it's tough, you're right. Like it's, it's hard to know who's doing great work and it's hard to know who is not, who's not going to be skeptical of the work that you want them to do on your behalf. So it's a tough question. Any other questions? Um, I was wondering, uh, what is your experience with science in the city? And how do you plan to do that investigation? What's the result and what is that doing? So I was just in um, London two weeks ago, and they have this really amazing system called Legible London. And it's a little city maps that are on almost every corner now, they're all, all throughout the downtown. Um, and they show you on a map where you are, what's five minutes away and what's 10 minutes away walking. To me, that's like the most amazing signage that you could put in a city because yes, we have our phones and you can type something in and figure out how long it takes to get somewhere. But it confronts you with the information and it makes you understand that it's not that far. So you look at that and you're like, oh, that's Big Ben is only five minutes away. Like it seems so much farther than that. But also that it's not in miles, it's in minutes, which I think you try to do the math in your head and you're like, oh, that's a mile. I think I ran that in gym one time in this much time. But it actually, just minutes is all you need to know. Like a normal person can walk this distance in this amount of time. So I think that's the most effective thing. That's what I'd want to see every downtown in the United States do. In Philadelphia, they actually are, have a pretty good system as well. But that's what I'd want to see first and foremost. We don't we don't need to know a lot of the information that's on the signs in our, city, in our cities, I feel like. And we just need to know, like, on foot, like, where we can get safely and quickly. So that's my, that's my top vote. So if Denver can do that, that would be amazing. Anyone else? Oh, okay. If you have any more questions, um, feel free to ask me them. 